Thank you. Great. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, so first of all, I've really enjoyed the talks and panelists over the last day and a half, and I hope that what I'm going to talk about today will bring some of that and relate to some of that here. Uh, the talk I'm going to give today is actually, it's three of us who have put this together. And uh, Robert Sakik uh, Traglik was actually a visiting researcher here. Uh, he did his PhD and part of it was here. He then uh, went to practical action, was working with Colin. And then I stole him from practical action and uh, um, he now is in Vienna. And then Amy Donovan is at University of Cambridge and myself. And I'm quite pleased. What we're going to present here is my first social science paper. And this came out a couple months ago. And basically, just to summarize, it's a where we approached members of the natural hazard community and asked them what they felt the challenges were for the natural hazard community. So what I'm going to do is I'll first talk about motivation, then I'll do methods and database, uh, then I will do the survey results, and then some reflections from here. I've tried to aim for about 30 minutes time for some discussion. If it ends up being more, that's fine. The other thing I should note is most of my text was as screen grabs for images. And so what that means is any text here that is screen grabs will be quite low resolution just because of the issues we're having with the monitor. So hopefully you can hear it when I speak it, but won't necessarily be able to see that. So let me just um, go to the motivation. The motivation of this is I'm one of the executive editors for the journal Natural Hazards, Earth System Sciences. And I proposed to the other executive editors, we have our 20th anniversary was this year, and I thought it would be interesting to approach the broader natural hazard community, the physical side, and just ask them what they felt the challenges were. And so the four of us, um, the executive editors, we put together a questionnaire and we launched this. So the methods we used were uh, the four NHS executive editors, we discussed, we designed two quest questions. We tried to keep them very, very simple so that people would be more likely to respond, which they did. And the two questions we asked are what are the top three scientific challenges currently facing our understanding of natural hazards? And the second question we asked is what three broad step changes should or could be done by the natural hazard community to address natural hazards in achieving the sustainable development goals. And so these were two broad questions, simple ones. We asked people to reply with three bullet points each for what they thought. And I threw these into a Google Forms to make it simple after looking at different things with the uh, introduction, asking the questions. And also I did appropriate ethics because we knew we would want to analyze this data afterwards. And so we give, gave people the choice of identifying themselves by name, organization, uh, and also their institution. And quite a few people did end up. Uh, this database minus the names and the institutions we've uh, generalized them is now open access and we've made this available with the paper if other people want to do this. So we advertise this via Twitter, Facebook, email to various places. It was one advantage. I've worked quite a bit with the European Geosciences Union over the years. So we had access to a broader group that we could do. We, I estimate we reached about 2,000 to 4,000 people, and we left the questionnaire open for two months. Uh, about th so 350 people responded, which was quite good for a questionnaire. And you know, basic data processing, we cleaned up the, well, I cleaned up the Excel database. Uh, we t took away odd returns and XX spaces and looked at who did reply anything and double returns and stuff like that. 
Uh, we group the countries into regions, and then we group the institutes into types. Did a bit of summary metrics to see the number of words per response, the number of uh, other things, just to see what was going on. And then we also identified the sustainable development goals that were identified in their responses. So I'll just give you a couple of examples if the graphics come out. And so these are examples of three of the 350. So we broke up here into the, on the left in column one, two, and three are to the first question and into the next three is the second question. And then they also, uh, where they are from, the country, et cetera. So in terms of the responses by country, because this was largely European focused that we did this, uh, the regions were mostly European with the largest percentage from Southern Europe and then we go down into Eastern Europe and then we start to get obviously into small numbers if we want to do categorizations by region. Uh, Asia, we did have some respond. We did this mostly through European Geosciences using and Facebook and Twitter feeds. Uh, I'll mention later, I did do the same sort of survey in Asia. There are 450 responses now waiting to be analyzed. Uh, Hannah, if you're looking for another project, um, that might be a fun one for you to work with me on. But uh, institutions, largely university, but we also had laboratories, government organizations, and some NGOs, one uh, person identified for that. 123 of the 350 respondents explicitly mentioned a hazard. We didn't ask them for hazards. And uh, the other executive editors and I said, well, we should, should we make a more you know, detailed survey? And we finally decided not to because we thought that we'd get fewer responses. But many people did answer. And so what we did is we divided these into category groups and there are various single hazards here that are mentioned that we pulled in. Uh, and then we put these into a graphic with some quotes here. The large percentage of these were geophysical uh, hazards that were mentioned. So just to remind you, those are earthquakes and landslides and tsunamis and volcanoes. Then we went to the hydrological, the atmospheric, the marine, the biophysical, and finally, the environmental. And there's some quotes here just to give you an idea, like the marine saltwater intrusion in estuary and regions and changes in freshwater supply. And so we, we just to get an idea of what the constituencies were. Then from there, we did an analysis. And this was led by Robbie very much. It was research that he led on. And we did a thematic analysis using NVivo software. Uh, Amy Donovan and myself worked with him on this research. And what we did is explored the data through critical reading and understanding the most used phrases. And so this is a textual analysis, which of course has some biases in it, but there's three of us to try and minimize some of these biases that might appear. So Robert generated the initial codes and go, he went through every single phrase and he generated 58 codes for the question one and 38 codes, codes for question two. We discussed these, we revised them as a group. We then merged these into 11 themes for question one and nine themes. We reviewed them and discussed them again and finally came up with six themes for challenges and six themes for step changes. But all of that information is available. And there was a lot of discussions amongst us with clearly a subjective based on our experience. So what I'll do now is I'll move into the results. And I'm going to break these into three parts. The first part of the results is the challenges that we found that were identified by the natural hazard community. The second one are the step changes, and the third one are regional differences that we found. And just to 
you know, give you a highlight. There's nothing here that's surprising that came out. A lot of this has been written about in the literature. It's just often when approaching the scientific community, the sample sizes are much smaller, or they tend to be expert interviews that are much more in depth. So what are the top three scientific challenges you believe currently facing our understanding of natural hazard? The percentages here are those that mentioned it out of the 350, and of course they can mention more than one of these. And so some people might have mentioned three of these, and they would appear in each category. Some people might not have clearly mentioned any one of them, and so they would appear in zero of them. So the first is shortcomings in knowledge of risk and risk components, and I'll be going through each one of these after this slide. The second one, deficiencies of hazard and risk reduction approaches. The third one, influence of global change, especially climate change, integration of social factors, inadequate translation of science to policy and practice, and not surprisingly, lack of interdisciplinary approaches. And one thing before we go further is just to highlight that just because it's low here, it's actually quite interesting that it ended up in this final categorization. So low does not mean it's unimportant. That means that 6% out of the 350 were mentioning it. And that's an appreciable number to be mentioning it. So anything that appears in this final categorization means that these are considered major challenges by the natural hazard community. And again, mostly natural hazard scientists. So if we go through each one of these, shortcomings in knowledge of risk and risk components, so this includes such things as our understanding of natural processes. But it also includes that on the hazard side, but it also includes things like our understanding of vulnerability, our understanding of exposure. And these, a lot of scientists are now recognizing to get a full understanding of risk, we really need to understand all three of these. One of the things I found interesting in doing this is in 2007, I wrote a paper with Dave Patley. And we wrote a paper on the challenges facing the natural hazard community. And I was very interested to see some of the same very things that we talked about 15 years ago appearing again 15 years later as there's still challenges. And so it's something I'm thinking about, well, how are we going to change some of these things? There are some quotes here. So respondent 206, an engineer from Greece, lack of knowledge for the links between multiple hazards or chain hazards. And this was one of the subcategories of the shortcomings in knowledge of risk and risk components which was highlighted by quite a few people, multi-hazards, the hazard interrelationships, the uncertainties when we have multiple hazards that are working together or one triggering another. And that's particularly one area of research that I study is thinking about multiple multi-hazard interrelationships. Uh, Another one, data, their precision, their location in time and space, and their completeness. Hypotheses made behind the method of hazard assessment. The limit of validity and uncertainty. And quite a few people brought up this idea of uncertainty. And of course, this is something as uh, when we think about the hazard is what is the uncertainty of it. But we should also be thinking about it for exposure and for vulnerability. And too often when we talk about uncertainty, we think about it in terms of the hazard, the model, the forecasting. We don't think about it in terms of the vulnerability of the population and the uncertainties. We often take a number and we plug it in and say this is what we represent. One of the questions I was going to ask Colin earlier was this was great that there was vulnerability maps. That was really encouraging to see in Nepal. And I'm curious, though, did those vulnerability maps then bring in dynamic vulnerability? So the idea that the vulnerability is changing where people are during the day, uh, during the week, and during the seasons. Because often, hazard managers don't take this into account when they're thinking of 
uh, hazard management plans. They have a static vulnerability idea. They also have a static exposure idea. Um, deficiencies of hazard and risk reduction approaches, 37% of the 350. And so this ranges from better forecasting, so now casting and forecasting natural hazards in data scarce regions, so a lot about forecasting, but also about the management of, uh, of hazard and risk reduction approaches. So how do we manage the approach? And so there's often not good sharing of knowledge between hazard managers of how do we manage our risk management approaches. There's a lot more that is being written about that. Uh, the next one, influence of global change, especially climate change. So a professor in Portugal, a poor understanding regarding the concepts of global warming, climate change, and extreme events. So this came through quite a bit, which is what actually is the influence of climate change, anthropogenic climate change, on natural hazards and vice versa? Because there is uh, a circular effect sometimes going on here. And that is something that I think we, we're starting to understand this for certain single hazards, but there are other single hazards. I was looking recently, uh, um, I was reviewing a movie script for Warner and it was on climate change. And I was thinking, okay, well, it's about climate change and natural hazards that might occur. I think the movie's coming out in a few months. I'm gonna be really curious if they've taken any of the rewriting I did of their characters, particularly the, the very last quote, but I'll, I'll see when it comes out. It's the sequel to Aquaman, uh, so that should be kind of fun. But one thing I found when I was doing this research was, okay, you know, we, we have a good idea where storms might be, but then when I got to wildfires and trying to say, here is kind of climate change, what we think is going to happen in 20 years, 30 years, where are wildfires going to be more prevalent? That was a lot harder to find in the published literature. And then I was trying to go into things like hailstorm and other things like that. And it was more difficult to find the actualities of all of the single hazards that I listed at the beginning actually being listed and thinking through what might be the implications. Uh, it's not then just the implications of climate change on single hazards, but also climate change on humans. So what is migration going to be? You know, what is going to be the influence on vulnerability? And are we intertwining these with the hazard and where the exposure will be? If we have a large group of people move from one place to another, that means more buildings, the exposure is going to change, the vulnerability is going to change. And so this came through here in 1C, the integration of social factors, understanding the interaction and feedback between physical and social processes of natural hazards in a is essential. And this was from the USA, a research fellow. And it's really understanding that interaction of the two. There is work being done, but there's a lot more work that certainly could be done. 1E, inadequate translation of science, policy, and practice. The major challenge is that no matter how researchers show the risk, policymakers seem not to pay much attention. This is a serious problem. This was from Ecuador, a professor. Turning science into better planning and design, much science seems to dislodge from this part of the process. So there was a lot of comments about the challenges of translation, that it's not being translated appropriately, but also that as scientists we're not trained to do that translation. And so who should be doing the translation itself? 1F, lack of interdisciplinary approaches, Interestingly, I think this has improved quite a bit, you know, in 15 years. But there's still quite a bit of bolt-on interdisciplinary re research. And we could talk about transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. And for me, interdisciplinary means genuinely people working together and 
talking about it and coming up with an overall whole that is much better than if they had worked separately. Uh, transdisciplinary, you're working across disciplines. And so it's really this interdisciplinary approaches. And there are some really good practices. Uh, but sometimes it's on paper, and it doesn't come out in the final research grants. Now, if we go through the step changes, which is the next part, so what three broad step changes should or could be done by the natural hazard community to address natural hazards in achieving the sustainable development goals? So the first one was enhanced stakeholder engagement, communication and knowledge transfer, then increased management and reduction of disaster risks, and you'll see quite a bit of mirroring with the challenges, obviously, here. Enhanced interdisciplinary research and its translation to policy and practice, better understanding of natural hazards, better data, enhanced access to data and data sharing, and increased attention to developing countries. And so if we start with the first one, enhanced stakeholder engagement, communication, and knowledge transfer, it's very interesting that this was the top one identified, 39% of the 350 scientists. Now, you saw that for the challenges, they started off, and many of them were more on the natural process side. These are natural hazard scientists, many of them. But many of them are recognizing that actually it's the enhanced stakeholder engagement, communication, and knowledge transfer that we need to help achieve the sustainable development goal. So dissemination to society, increased presence on social media, be part of school programs, inform more in a more accessible way. This was a professor in Portugal again. And I think this is a shift we've been seeing over the last 20 years. I know that 20 years ago when I was first really kind of, I was a new lecturer, you know, keen in the field. I'd just come out of a postdoc and thinking, oh, this is great. And you met a lot of natural hazard scientists who were very single hazard focused and very focused on their equations, their models, their the newest techie thing. And I, I must admit, I, I would love to get my hands on the drone. Uh, so, you know, there, there is a lot of that, and that still exists. But I hear more and more from PhD students and from early career scientists, we want to make a difference. We want to see what this is going to do. We want to see how we can translate this to practice. And often this word keeps coming up, how do we take this academic work and translate it to something that will be practical and that's not just a case study. So reach out to not only government officials and policymakers, but also affected communities in meaningful ways and not just through flybys that lack true engagement. That was from the USA. Increase management and reduction of disaster risks. And so that was 34% of the 350. Accelerate the development and implementation of nature-based solutions. And this came up quite a bit. Let's bring in the nature-based solutions. And that was quite interesting to see. Move from hazard forecasting to impact-based forecasting. And this is sort of a mantra you keep hearing from people like the UK Met Office. And I knew that when many of us are working in Global South, we are trying to encourage this way of thinking of rather than hazard forecasting, think about the impact-based forecasting and where we are with that. Better integrate exposure and vulnerability components of risk, providing information better used for disaster risk reduction actions. The third one, enhanced interdisciplinary research and its translation to policy and practice. And so it's not just the interdisciplinarity, but how is that going to translate to policy? And then how do we get it to practice? So uh, pushing for more applied research and looking for ways to ensure the continuity of the process initiated by a research project once the project is over. And I think this is something I know I'm pushing now quite a bit in all research grants that I know many of my colleagues. What's going to be the legacy? How do we ensure legacy? Better understanding of natural uh, hazards. This can range from the hazard, 
So the physical processes, but also their interactions with humans themselves. Better data, enhanced access to data, and data sharing. This is a big one that I'm really keen on, and I know that when I come to Durham, I'm very much going to be thinking about data, data sharing, open access data, what can we do with data? And so to promote open data and open science, so much data has been locked away by many data holders and is very underused. This was a professor from the UK. Gathering comprehensive data sets that cover a broad range of hazard data with sufficient time overlap to enable comprehensive causal relationship analysis. And finally, increased attention to developing countries, 6% of the 350. And so that's, you know, it's only 20 or 21. Would have been nice to maybe have had a few more in that category, but that's very much in there, more focus on providing robust and applicable research findings in low data developing country environments. And so we also looked at all the sustainable development goals, and this was a figure that uh, Robbie put together, uh, which I quite like when the colors come out, it's quite nice. And what it is, is we basically put the percentage of responses of 188 of the respondents actually mentioned a specific sustainable development goal. Now what's interesting here is yes, climate action is the top, but what you'll see is every one of the other sustainable development goals is mentioned here. And that in itself is quite interesting that the natural hazard community feels that there are step changes that we can contribute to that won't just address two or three of the sustainable development goals, but all of them. And so that was the takeaway there. We also looked at regional differences in the results, and uh, we, we broke them down. This is the natural hazard challenges. Most regions, you can see higher percentages going to lower percentages, similar to the larger ones. The exception was Asia with theme 1A, and 1A is the shortcomings in knowledge of risk and risk components. They were much lower in percentage than other regions. And theme 1A is primarily concerned with the absence of physical knowledge. And this was the sustainable development goals, the step changes for those. And what's interesting here is to note that relatively few respondents suggested the need, the need for theme 2F, which was the increased attention to developing countries, except when you get to South and Central America, the Caribbean, Oceania, and Africa. Uh, so th there was interest there. Now, for the last couple minutes, I'm just going to do some reflections and conclusions and then open it up for uh, five or six minutes, I think. So the respondent profiles were mainly from Europe. And I did do a similar questionnaire in Asia. I guess there's 400 responses. It's not yet analyzed. I'd be quite keen to analyze it while it's still in date, because it was uh, not that long ago we did that. And it's a very different data set. We, we did it as part of the registration process for a conference that I co-organized uh, that was New Dimensions for Natural Hazards in Asia. And that is still waiting. It's mainly from the European Geosciences Union Natural Hazard Division and the Natural Hazard Earth System Science Journal communities. Social scientists and hazard managers will be underrepresented in this sample that we have. The analysis, we use thematic analysis, which is subjective on the positionality of the three of us that did this work. The challenges identified here, they align well with challenges that have been identified in the literature. That's certainly true. It's based on responses from a wider natural hazard community, and this compares well with the previous co co community. Um, the challenges identified uh, by the respondents are timely. You know, they're current. They're in line with big scientific questions. That's good, and it's. So things like the integration of social factors, the increased understanding of multi-hazards. Participants identified existing knowledge gaps and hazard processes, but also in our understanding of vulnerability, exposure, and impact. 
uh, it suggests a need for greater engagement between the natural hazard community and the social sciences. One of the things I found interesting is I, I downloaded a database of all of the natural hazard or system science papers with their abstracts and keywords and everything. And what I did is I took four or five year periods here and I looked at Keyword Plus, which is basically something from Web of Science, which are based on, these are words that they derive from all the references in each of the papers. And so there were 3,110 papers that had Keywords Plus information. I then uh, became an expert on word clouds and learned how to do them professionally, uh, which was quite interesting. And what we found, and also how to color, colorize keywords here. And what we found is that climate change, risk, impact, and vulnerability have been increasing over the years. Now, there are some other factors here. When I became an executive editor, I started to make, put a lot more emphasis in social sciences and bringing in that community into the journal. But I think this also is reflection of the hazard-based approaches transition to risk-based interdisciplinary approaches that many of us are now trying to take in our research. So our findings on the way forward, the step changes to achieve the sustainable development goals, I've already mentioned it, that the natural hazard community can contribute to all 17 SDGs. Most previous literature on the connection between disaster risk reduction and SDGs identified <coughs> fewer links. So we, we tried to put together four actionable steps. They're not anything, you know, really new, but we tried to say, okay, well, what is it that we would do for actionable steps? We were also asked by the editor to put it together for the revision of the paper. Uh, I said, well, what do you want to do then with this? So the first one is data. We need to make progress in continued towards better data, enhanced access to data, and data sharing in the context of natural hazards, risk, and DRR. And for me personally, I think I've been involved with 11 or 12 grants in the last 20 years, and I think eight or nine in the last seven years. And I think the stumbling block of many major grants I have been on has been the data. You get into it, particularly in the Global South, you're told there's good data, you think there's good data, you get a few months into the grant, you realize the data isn't there, and all of a sudden six months, eight months, a year, two years is lost trying to get good data. And it's often this understanding of what good data is, where the data is, how the data flows, and the open sharing of data. Research, fundamental and applied research should be continued in understanding natural hazards and more widely risk drivers. Interdisciplinarity, uh, increased funding of interdisciplinary research focused on implementing SDGs in context of natural hazards. And I should mention there are some very good practices being done in a number of countries on a number of these aspects, but there are many countries that are not. The UK has been doing a very good job, for instance, on uh, interdisciplinarity and its calls for research grants. Collaboration, enhanced collaboration between natural hazard scientists, decision makers, and wider actors, such for instance, civil society in charge of implementing the SDGs. A good example of that is the Natural Hazard Partnership here in the UK, that is a model that could be used in many other countries, but then to make sure that it's coming back to the SDGs and how we're thinking about them. So if you're interested in reading further, uh, it's open access, the paper, the database is open access. You're welcome to look at it here. And thank you for listening and I'll now open up to questions and comments. And also comments or just discussion, I'm happy with. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, thanks. So you mentioned that it is important to enhance the access um, to data. So this, does this mean like having better access to databases or does it actually include that we need to also publish um, tools to process this data or to visualize the data to make this data useful? Yeah. How, how, yeah, how far do we need to go if we want to improve? So the question is, is it the data itself or the access to data and the visualization of it both? And so some of this, I'm going to go off of what the scientific community was saying, but it's very much uh, how do you access the data? Who has access to the data? And is a community have access to that data? The UK has done a really, really good job in, over the past years, and increasingly so, in making sure that data that it has collected is accessible in a visual and friendly format, not all of the data, but some of the data, is easily available to the public. And this is a question, who do you want this data aimed at? Uh, the problem is when data gets locked up. So an example would be there's a lot of case studies that are done in many Global South countries. It gets locked up in different places. People try to publish it, but because it's not at international levels or it's a case study, it doesn't get published. And so there's an active discussion among scientists now, how do we get this record of impact, hazard and impact, uh, vulnerability, all of these so that we can start better understanding so that we can apply from one place to another. I've been particularly working in Kenya. I've had four projects there, five in the past 10 years, and data has been a major issue there. It just gets locked up. So I'll move to other questions and comments. They can often be used as like buzzwords in grant applications and how are you going to, like, I think when people are writing applications, they kind of just cover these things just because they want to get the grants and maybe don't put enough thought into them. Mm. How do we actually move forward in making sure that these are things that are really thoroughly thought about? Yeah, so that's a very good question, which is basically how do we go from the buzzwords in writing grant applications to making sure it's effective. Part of it is making sure that people such as myself, when we chair these panels, that we recognize that. I can read a grant proposal and generally figure out if it's buzzwords or if they are genuinely doing an integration. So there are certain things that you look for. Uh, you ask for project letters of support and make sure that they're meaningful project letters of support, although NERC now is starting, uh, UKRI is starting to get rid of those because it's trying to reduce the paperwork. You look at how they've integrated the time, the travel, the integration between the people. So there are clues when you read a grant proposal as to whether it's meaningful interdisciplinarity, how it's written or whether it's not meaningful. Now, of course, I can teach you how to write it so it looks meaningful, but often when it's written down in that way, it looks meaningful. It's the same thing about co-production. You know, uh, a buzzword these days is make sure that you've talked with your, uh, the people who are going to most benefit by this. And you can often quickly tell in a grant proposal whether They've just written it in, and they've been involved with the actual writing, or they've just written it in and there's no legacy. But that means that the people who are reviewing the grants need to be given that direction, and the people on the panel need to be looking out for these things. Thanks, Bruce. <clears throat> Very interesting. I I guess one of the questions I'd have is, who's driving the research agenda? Huh. Is, 
is there enough, is it too top down or is there enough bottom up? And what can we do to actually get, I mean, particularly in the developing world, more communities, more people on the front lines shaping research agendas rather than donors and national governments? And do we need to do that? Thank you. Yeah. So the question is who is driving the research agenda? Um, so first of all, I don't think it's just the donors and the research organizations that's driving it. I would disagree with that. I do think that academic scientists such as myself are helping drive it. We are often asked for our opinions on what is needed. Uh, I've seen a number of places where things we've written in papers that I've been involved with have later turned into grants uh, research calls. Uh, in terms of going lower down, the question then is how we involve them. I'm not sure the answer to that. I'm not a social scientist. There might be others here who are better able to answer that. Obviously, I know that NERC will go to communities sometimes or they will uh, have a tender and ask us to go to communities to figure out what people feel are the most important issues to be faced. A lot of people, academics, research agenda, feel that we're, we're best set to set the agenda by listening and sifting the ideas. Right? I'm going to leave that there because uh, I might get myself into hot water there. <laughs> This is really interesting. So this is sort of following on um, Colin's question, um, which was what I had partially formulated in my mind. So thank you for saying this so eloquently. I mean, I was, so I was trying to think about, um, I mean, this is a survey. So you've gotten lots of different answers from lots of different people. So of course, there are tensions in it between what some people want and what other people want. Um, and so I was trying to think about how we deal with the call for more involvement of communities, more emphasis on impacts and community vulnerabilities on the one hand, um, and open data on the other. Um, and if there's a role for uh, approaches like citizen science um, and training communities to be collecting data and yeah. to be contributing to open source data um, on their own. Now, of course, in marginalized communities without digital connectivity or internet, which is something that Hannah and I have been looking at, that's a real challenge. Um, but it is something that people have been working with and on in um, environmental science and so on for a while. So I'm just wondering, if, um, given your long experience in this field, um, if you had any thoughts on that or have seen good examples of it, or um, yeah. if, there's, if that might be a way of bridging these kind of seemingly contradictory or problematic opinions. So uh, the short answer is yes. I'm strongly for citizen science and collection of data. I'll give one example. In India, the project I've been involved with for four years with uh, PAC and British Geological Survey and Met Office. When we originally went there, the Geological Survey of India was, you know, when we collect landslide data, we collect it because then we will be sure of it. And then, you know, slowly through discussions I had with them and others had with them, well, you know, are you really able to collect the data? Do, wouldn't it be nice if we had some help? The end result of that was, which I very much spearheaded and pushed, and it took a lot of effort, was a mobile app, which we have a couple NGOs working, which is now usable by the public in each of these local areas, and which now the Geological Survey of India has completely reversed its thought and feel that they must have this local collection of data to collect the landslides that they can't get to because they're off in Delhi or Calcutta and they're not local. And so we were able to achieve a complete change. I think it's one of the successful things to come out of the grant. We, we got a mindset change. Now, of course, when that is happening, we are listening to them. And so there was a lot of, well, this is happening, but this is what we're really concerned with. And can you tell us more about the following? So I do agree that citizen science, local collection of data is important. It also helps people be aware 
of what might be around them. Where I want to say we have to be very careful is there's often this strong enthusiasm of here's our mobile phone app, please use it. And by the way, we were working in areas that often had very, very poor data connectivity. Uh, so we worked through the technical aspects of that with a technical team of how to collect data and then have it upload later. Uh, so the, the issue here is we, we have these mobile apps, people get very enthused about them, but that might not be the most pressing thing they have to worry about. And so often what will happen with this citizen science is there's a lot of enthusiasm for one cycle, one year, and then, well, they're not paying me, why should I keep doing this? And so you need to have some sort of structure that it's put into, into education or something like that that will have some legacy.